start. Thank you all for coming. I'm very pleased that I can announce lecture by uh, uh, Leo Panic. As you all probably know, Leo Panic is the professor of political theory at York University and the editor of one of the most relevant and uh, 50, now 50, this is the 50th year of the, of the magazine, uh, Socialist Registry. Leo is a member of the editorial board. Also, he has published numerous books and articles. The last one called uh, the, global, uh, the Making of Global Capitalism, the Political Economy of American Imperialism, co-authored with uh, Sam Guinea, just uh, was awarded by with, uh, Isaac Deutsche Memorial Prize uh, last year. So Leo is one of the most renowned uh, mar contemporary Marxists, and also not just in terms of in, in academic terms, but also participating in lots of uh, political uh, debates from his from from Canada, where he lives, to the different debates, let's say in Greece, with the with the series and different political uh, uh, actors. The title of the I will not speak too long. The title of the Leo's lecture is "Whose Crisis: Capital, State, and Labor Today." In it, uh, Leo will, will make some kind of trajectory, political and economic, of the crisis and try to explain how the, how the, and ask the question, who is the, to, let's put it more proper, who is to blame for the, uh, for the, for the crisis, or to understand the difference, the relation between capital and labor, and how the different states, different national states reacted to the crisis, and how we can read all these uh, questions to the prism of, of uh, relations between uh, USA and, and, and Europe and other uh, global actors. So the lecture will take between 45 minutes and an hour. After it, of course, you can ask the question, put some comments, and we'll discuss it. So please, Leo. And also, please just sign the list of uh, participants. We need it uh, for our panelists. Thank you. Thank you, Marco. Uh, this uh, is the first time I've been in Croatia uh, for 25 years. And uh, in one sense, sitting here under a uh, painting of Tito and beside a bust of Tito, uh, nothing has changed. Uh, because the last time I was here, uh, I was invited to speak uh, at the League of Communist Party School in Kumrovic. Uh, and I was actually given, as a gift for speaking there, a uh, glass uh, bottle of Tito that was filled with Slivovitz. Um, it was, uh, in another sense, uh, looking at this audience, everything has changed. Uh, because there, there were 300 men at the party school, and they were all men. There wasn't a single woman in the room. All in suits. I think I was the only person, person here tonight wearing a sports jacket, even. Um, and uh, I got myself invited. I didn't know it was the party school I'd be invited to, but it was my friend Mike Leibovitz, uh, who had done a lot of work on uh, self-management uh, here. Uh, when I got invited to this annual conference that the League of Communists used to organize called Socialism in the World. Uh, they had it in Savtad every year and they would invite intellectuals from all over the world of every description. It was completely open, uh, so long as you were a socialist. So there'd be people there from Cuba, from East Germany, from the United States, uh, and so on. Um, and. Uh, it was not a very interesting conference because they ran it as though it was a diplomatic meeting. They didn't want to offend anybody. So all of the papers were given in alphabetical order. There would be a paper on women in Algeria, followed by a paper on urban struggles in Montreal, followed by a paper on uh, the civil war in El Salvador. And this is it made no sense. It was interesting in terms of meeting people, but so when I got invited again, I said I wouldn't go unless they, I said to Mike Leibovitz, unless they took me to somewhere more interesting uh, uh, where I could actually get a sense of what was going on in the country. But by going to Kumrovitz, I didn't get any sense of what was going on in the country. Uh, and I rather alienated them by uh, telling them about a book about how socialist parties, working class parties, 
uh, became oligarchies. That was written by a student of Weber's in, in 1916. Uh, okay. Uh, I think another difference, uh, perhaps, was that I very much got a sense uh, when I was here in 1989 and when I was uh, in the Soviet Union in 1990, Gorbachev was already uh, coming apart, that uh, there was a tremendous uh, attraction to capitalism. The common f phrase you would find in the media, but from ordinary people and from intellectuals, was that capitalism is normal. And what we want is a normal society. And their sense of what was normal was a shopping center in Los Angeles. Uh, so uh, what's very interesting in coming back now, 25 years later, after the transition to capitalism uh, in Croatia, uh, as I prepared myself to come, uh, was to see in the Financial Times just the week before I left to go to London, before I came here, uh, a little item in the paper that is headlined in the Financial Times, Fear of Capitalism Holding Croatia Back, says President. You all know this quote that your president says, I don't have to read it. Okay. Uh, and you know, he says that there is this uh, apprehension about capitalism in Croatia, whereas in 1989, there was this sense that this is where we need to go. This is what we should have been. This is what we might yet be, right? Uh, and this is rather ironic, because after all, we are in the middle of the fourth great global capitalist crisis. We are eight years into that crisis. Uh, and uh, if you compare it with the crisis of the 1930s, in the eighth year of that crisis that began in 1929, uh, in 1937, after all of the reforms of the New Deal were already introduced, uh, there was a second downturn, a very deep one, the uh, downturn of 1937-38. It was only the war then then pulled capitalism definitively out of uh, the crisis of the 1930s. And there is a great deal of discussion and speculation, some in the open, much more behind closed doors, uh, a great concern uh, that we may be seeing eight years after the beginning of this crisis a similar second dip. Uh, the concern inside the United States, where there has been a recovery and unemployment uh, has continued to fall, although that it's very contradictory, and I'll talk about that, there's a great concern that uh, the zero growth in Europe uh, this year, and especially the increase in unemployment in Germany and what looks like a recession in the last quarter of this year in Germany, uh, will have the effect of dragging the world economy back down into a, uh, a, a series of quarters uh, where there is zero growth or, or, or less than that. And the hope and expectation at the beginning of this crisis that the high rates of growth in the large developing countries of the capitalist South China, Brazil, the BRICS, etc., that they would pick up the slack in demand so that profits could be realized, given there's been a cutback in the, given the growth of un, in unemployment, uh, the, the cutback in credit, and so on, that they would pick up the slack in wor world demand uh, for capitalist production uh, is not being realized. Uh, rates of growth uh, in India. Uh, in Brazil, in China, while uh, by no means uh, 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 approaching zero, as in Germany or most of the rest of Europe, uh, are nevertheless considerably 
less than what they were in their boom years uh, in these countries. So the question I want to pose tonight is whose crisis is it really? It's a crisis of capitalism. As I said, the fourth great crisis of a global kind in capitalism's history. Uh, the last quarter of the 19th century, the 1930s, the 1970s, and now this one. Right. It's a crisis of capitalism, but within that framework, whose crisis is it? Is it a crisis of capital, of the capitalist classes? Is it a crisis of the capitalist state? Or is it, in fact, turning out to be a crisis for labor? All capitalist crises are crises for labor, of course, in terms of who pays the price for them, although many capitalists pay the price for them and many capitalist governments pay the price for them. Many capitalist regimes pay the price for them. Uh, but it, is it a crisis for labor in the sense that uh, it is unable to take advantage of the crisis politically? Is it a crisis for labor in terms of an inability to organizationally develop in face of the crisis? And unless you're one of those Marxists who thinks that the, the, there's an inevitability that capitalist crises, the contradictions in capitalism, the tendency of the rate of profit to fall, etc., will bring capitalism to an end of itself. Uh, unless you're that kind of Marxist, which I'm not, then capitalism will, you must recognize, although it may create opportunities for working classes to develop and organize and transcend capitalism, there is no inevitability that they will use crises in this way or be able to use them in this way. Okay. As I said, we're in the eighth year of the crisis. Now, most people start talking about the crisis as though it happened in the fall of 2008 with the collapse of the Lehman Brothers Investment Bank in the fall of 2008. Uh, no, it happened over a year before that, a year and a half before that, the equivalent of the 1929 stock market crash was the collapse of the second largest mortgage company in the United States. It was called First Century Financial. That occurred in March, April 2007. Uh, that then triggered a crisis in what is known as the money markets, the, where short-term bonds are traded, where most of the banks and corporations are engaged in turning over their cash flow, trying to get some low rates of interest for that. Uh, uh, and, and they, insofar as they are indebted, uh, they're able to uh, keep going by going into this short-term money market and borrowing again. Right? And uh, after that collapse in the American mortgage system, it caused a crisis in uh, the money markets. Uh, and that led, uh, by July, August uh, 2007, just to show you how integrated global finance is, uh, that led to the inability of the great French bank, Paribus, to be able to go into the money market and borrow funds to pay off its investors in three of its largest investment funds. Uh, and uh, Paribus had to be bailed out. Uh, what most people aren't aware is that uh, not only Paribus, but foreign banks around the world by July 2007, August 2007 really, were being bailed out by the American Central Bank, by the Federal Reserve Bank of the United States. Uh, the Federal Reserve Bank largely hid that because Congress would be very upset that the American Central Bank is lending money to foreign banks. But if the foreign banks had failed, 
the degree of integration in the international financial system would have caused Wall Street banks to fail because that's who they owe money to. Uh, so the Federal Reserve is now really the world's central bank. It has the central responsibility. I even use the word, it has the central burden. It carries the burden right, of overseeing uh, the global capitalist financial system. And by August 2007, not only uh, the French banks, but even the Bank of China Limited was borrowing money from the Federal Reserve. Uh, in order to uh, not cause problems with American Congress, by the end of that year, the central banks had worked out what are known as swap arrangements, whereby the Federal Reserve swaps dollars, which everybody wanted, right, which banks around the world wanted uh, to stabilize as best they could uh, their balance sheets, in exchange for the currencies that nobody else wanted but the Federal Reserve would take in order to stabilize the other currencies. What caused this crisis? Most orthodox Marxists will want to look through the tea leaves of what was happening to try to find proof that it was a crisis of accumulation uh, along the formula of uh, Marx's tendency of the rate of profit to fall as outlined in volume three of Capital. Uh, I think it is antithetical to historical materialism to look for one single crisis of, cause of crises all through capitalist history. Uh, Paul Sweezy, the great Marxist American economist, once wrote a letter to his friend Paul Baran, where he said that formula, formulas are the opium of the economists. And Marx wasn't free of that either. This was not a crisis of overaccumulation in the sense that Marx was trying to describe, whereby, because of capitalist competition, capitalists displace living labor by fixed labor, by fixed capital, yes? And since they get their surplus out of living workers, right, there is a decline in surplus. A, and this shows as a profitability crisis. There was no profitability crisis in the run-up to the current crisis. On the contrary, uh, profits were going up uh, in the first part of this century, and as we see today, Profits are very high for the world's leading corporations. I'll come back to this at the moment. It's still not a profitability crisis. It's an investment crisis, but not a profitability crisis. It was also not caused, as most people on the left and the right were predicting, by a crisis of the American dollar caused by the balance of payments deficit in the United States. Everybody was saying, look how much the Americans are borrowing from the Chinese, right? or from the Japanese for that matter. It's not entirely clear who buys treasury bonds. A lot of them are bought in London. Uh, but in any case, uh, uh, there's no question that China's tremendous trade sur surplus, like Japan's tra tremendous trade surplus, means that they buy dollars right? uh, in order to ensure that the American dollar doesn't get devalued because that would change the exchange rate and the Chinese wouldn't be able to export as much to the United States. So uh, what they do with the dollars they make in their big trade surplus is they buy the safest investments there are in the world, which is American Treasury bills, which is low rates of interest, etc. cetera. Uh, and people were predicting, well, it's inevitable. The Chinese are going to pull their renminbi out of the dollar. That isn't what happened. Far from it. In fact, then what happened instead was that uh, not only the French bank Paribus and its investment funds and Deutsche Bank, uh, but also uh, the Chinese were turning to buy American mortgages. 
which paid a higher rate of interest, but which they knew, since uh, these mortgages were backed by the semi-public uh, American banks in the mortgage market, known as Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, they knew that if there was a collapse in the mortgage market, the American state would come in and protect those banks, right? would save those banks, be the lender of last resort. And that's exactly what happened. This, there was a big mortgage bubble. Uh, those mortgages collapsed, and the American state nationalized those two semi-public agencies that buy mortgages off banks. Now, this is really very ironic. Because who is buying these mortgages? Uh, it is American workers who are buying these mortgages. Uh, American wages, given the defeat of American trade unionism since the era of Reagan, since the crisis of the 1970s, have stagnated. But the American worker's standard of living has not gone down. It's not gone down for various reasons. American workers have worked longer hours. More people in their family have worked, especially women, but also children. Uh, usually in precarious jobs. Uh, uh, but above all, uh, they have been able to keep their standard of living up through debt, through borrowing, through credit card borrowing, but also uh, through being able to take out mortgages. Uh, and if people already owned a home, they often took out a second mortgage on their home. That is, they would use the asset on their home to take out a mortgage with which they would buy the things they needed to buy, to keep up their standard of living. So you got this unbelievable irony whereby the world's capital was not only lending to the American state, right? and when you the reason that people lend to the American state, they buy treasury bonds, is because they know that the American state is the protector of property around the world. The role that the American state has is to protect capitalist property around the world, and it will, it is most unlikely to ever default on its debt. That's why even when there's a crisis, where does the world's capital put its money? Even when there's a massive American trade deficit, it right away buys American dollars and American treasury bills. Right. Uh, this just goes to show you, you can't make a distinction between states and markets and capitalism. Right? The two go together. But even more than that, what they were buying was American workers' debt. At the end of the Clinton administration, a very uh, important report was issued by the American Treasury, uh, which uh, took great pride in saying that the world's capital, including pension funds, work, American workers' pension funds, but also European workers' pension funds, and even the pension funds of workers in the Global South, were buying mortgages for American workers. Now, when Bush came in, he led every shyster into the mortgage business. Do people know the word shyster? They're kind of petty crooks, right? They're loan sharks. The Republican Party's base in every community is real estate brokers, right? That, in every community. And, uh, uh, the Congressional Inquiry on the crisis when it happened uh, uh, showed that in Florida alone, there were 10,000 people selling subprime mortgages who had criminal convictions. In Florida alone, and 4,000 of those had convictions for uh, fraud. Okay. But of course, I mean, these are the small shysters. The big ones are in Wall Street, who are creating these financial instruments. And these financial instruments allow a, the first century mortgage company or uh, a bank to sell a mortgage 
called a subprime mortgage in which you pay a very low rate of interest in the first year or two. And then after the first year or two, the interest goes up high to make up for the fact you were paying a low interest in the first year. And people found that they weren't able to pay once it went up that high. Uh, so that, and more than that, what they do with these mortgages, what they did with these mortgages, and now it's being done again, is they would uh, sell them off to an investment bank, each individual mortgage, that would repackage them into a security, a financial derivative, it's called, in, and which would have different kinds of tranches. So they would take the mortgages of petty bourgeois professors like me, with tenure who are going to be able to pay no matter what, and the mortgages of somebody who's a waiter in Miami, uh, who is entirely precarious, who might not be able to pay the mortgage. And they would mix that up into one security. And that's what the French bank, the investment fund of the French bank Paribas was buying. Uh, but the whole thing becomes, became unraveled. This was a crisis caused in the financial sector itself. This was a crisis of capitalist financial volatility. Now, as a Marxist, you're not taught to think that this can happen. Because finance is speculative. It's non-productive. Right? But this, this bifurcation between finance and production is, of course, ridiculous. And most of uh, Marx says, well, you have to remember that volume three of Capital was only published by Engels long after Marx's death. And one has to ask, why didn't Marx publish it while he was living? In my view, it was because he felt he hadn't worked this out correctly. But in any case, finance is the lifeblood of capitalism. It's the blood of the system. And although it is based on speculation, it is increasingly, it always has been, but ever more interlinked with production. I mean, in the example I'm giving, what could be more material than finance being crucial to the roof over people's heads? Right? It meets a basic necessity, housing. Right? That's what it was going into. But much more than that, the largest financial derivative markets in the world today are currency financial derivatives, are exchange rate derivatives. And these are absolutely crucial to the integrated networks of production we now have globally. When a Chinese firm makes a contract with Walmart to provide so many genes to Walmart signs the contract, say, in April, and says, we will deliver to the port in Long Beach, Los Angeles, California, next October, so many genes, and that's when the payment will come, they need to know that the exchange rate between the remnibi and the dollar won't have changed so much in international markets that they will have a margin for what they said they would provide those genes for. Right? So what they have to do in order to engage in this is they will buy what is known as a derivative in a futures market. It will guarantee them right, the rate that they, at the time they signed the contract next October. This is what goes on in every commodity sphere now, in oil, uh, etc. But it's absolutely crucial to the production networks. So all of the subcontracted employment uh, firms that are involved in value chains, not only for Walmart, but for Apple, for General Motors, et cetera, et cetera, are all engaged in these future markets and financial derivatives. And these aren't, sure, there's speculation. Somebody's thinking it'll, sw it'll swing that way. Somebody's thinking it'll swing that this way. But the point is, without them, you couldn't have these integrated uh, production networks that the world is now based on. Uh, and that's just one example of the way in which finance is crucial to production, of course, uh, leaving aside the usual uh, advance of capital uh, to productive firms 
uh, the kind of role that uh, corporate bonds play in attracting the capital that people need to invest, that corporations need to invest, etc., especially in a world where there's a free mobility of capital. But it is inevitably a highly volatile financial world because it is based on all of the speculation, although the speculation is connected to production. And that same report I mentioned from the 1990s under Clinton that talked about how remarkable it was that the world's investors were rushing to sell mortgages to American blacks and Latinos, to poor American workers, right? That same report, the central theme of it, was that we are no longer in the business of failure prevention. We can't be in the business of regulating finance so that it can prevent crises in a volatile world finance. Because were we to try to regulate too tightly this financial system, the innovation in these types of financial products, in these types of financial commodities, would get turned down. And indeed, by the time that these derivatives had developed so far, if we tried to introduce these regulations now, there would be a legal nightmare of what all the previous contracts amounted to. So no, we're no longer in the business of financial uh, uh, preve failure prevention, they said. And this is the most important, the most powerful state financial apparatus in the world, the American Treasury. We're not in the business of failure prevention. We are in the business of failure containment. Again, a lot of the left thinks that states are neoliberal because right-wing economists have read Hayek, or even worse, American congressmen have read Hayek. American congressmen don't read anything. Uh, and they tell governments what to do. No. Governments are not in this because they read Hayek. They're not even neoliberal, they're very pragmatic. They're very, very pragmatic career civil servants, most of them, or career professional politicians. Uh, what they see is that it becomes very difficult to prevent financial crises. They don't believe for a moment, like these Hayekian economists, that the system always goes back to equilibrium. They don't believe, they know there will be crises. Uh, and they see their role as getting good at containing crises, at preventing them from spreading too far. Through the 1970s, there were 72 financial crises around the world as one country after another, including this one, removed their capital controls. It may surprise you to know that the first country in Europe to remove its financial regulations was the country most people on the left who are not revolutionaries look up to most, Sweden. The great social democratic Sweden was the first European country to have a banking crisis. 1991, six years after they moved their, removed their financial regulations. And they did it because the 15 capitalist families that have always owned Sweden but made a deal with the very powerful Swedish labor movement in the 1930s. Yes. They were beginning to take their profits and their investment and invest it around the world. So in order to keep them in Sweden, they removed the financial regulation. This led to the first big banking crisis in Europe in 1991. In any case, as one country after another removed their financial uh, uh, controls, above all their external capital controls, uh, you saw a cascade of financial crises. And much more important than the role of the IMF, which in any case is uh, very integrally uh, interrelated with the American Treasury. It's just down the street from it. They have lunch together. Uh, somebody moves from a position in the Treasury to a position in the IMF and bank, and the Americans have a veto over whatever decisions the IMF make by the voting procedures in it. Uh, it's the American Treasury much more than the IMF, which plays the role when there's a financial crisis of trying to contain it. 
and they were remarkably successful from the Mexican peso crisis in 1974, although to the Asian crisis in 1997. I say they were successful, it isn't to say they didn't lie awake nights, right, as they tried to do this. That they didn't go back to see their wives and children for three weeks and didn't sleep on bunks in their offices as they go through these harrowing experiences of trying to contain this, right? But they managed to contain it until this big one in 2007, 2008. And despite the lending that they did, uh, that I began with in the summer and fall of 2007, it was not enough to contain it. And that led, by 2008, to the failure of these very big mortgage companies in the United States, which were nationalized by the American state. It led to the failure of one of the largest American investment banks, Lehman Brothers, with its greatest debts actually being held in London. And London is the center of European financial markets. Okay. Whose crisis then? It looked in the beginning of 2009 as the world's economy went into a complete downspin, uh, as, the, as world trade, for only the second time since 1945, global trade declined. And it declined by 11% at the beginning of 2009. The last time that it happened was during the oil crisis in the mid-1970s when it declined by 3%. Okay. Uh, it looked like uh, you were going to see a massive collapse of depression uh, uh, character, of the Great Depression character. Two things prevented this. Why is this called the Great Recession rather than the Great Depression? One is that the leaders of the G20 states were summoned to Washington in October 2008 after the collapse of uh, uh, these banks and after the Americans had put 700 billion dollars into the saving the, the financial system, the famous TAR program. Uh, the leaders of the G20 came to Washington, D.C. The G20 was a, uh, you heard of the G7, this is the big capitalist countries, uh, the organization of them, mainly of their treasury and finance, of their central bankers and finance ministers, was created in the crisis of the 70s as a means of coordinating how to get out of that crisis, uh, which they eventually successfully did, mainly by defeating labor. Uh, mainly by installing the debt crisis that brought the Yugoslav state down, that brought so many Latin American states down in the 1980s. Uh, the G20 had been created when it became clear by the end of the 90s that so many states in the global south were also becoming developing capitalist states. And in order to contain the crisis of uh, the Asian crisis in 1997-98, they created this G20 made up of the finance ministers and central bankers uh, of the large capitalist states of the global south. The leaders had never met. And it wasn't very important. The center of decision making at the international arena at this level remained the G7. And above all, remained the meetings of the finance ministers and central bankers of the United States, Britain, uh, Germany before the ECB and Japan. Uh, uh, but when the crisis was getting out of hand in the fall of 2008, for the first time, the leaders of the G20 states were brought. And they signed a remarkable document. The communique they issued was called a commitment to the free global economy in which they pledged in the, wake, in the face of this crisis not to introduce uh, anything that would interrupt free trade or free capital movement. Which is, of course, exactly what happened during the Great Depression. What happened during the Great Depression was the introduction of tariffs, 
and the introduction of capital controls, the interruption of international trade, the interruption of international capital movement. That's what occurred in the great 1930s. Right? And that commitment in 2008 has been rolled over every year in every meeting of the G20. It will be rolled over this month in Sydney, or in, they're not meeting in Sydney, in Brisbane, Australia. Some of you may remember uh, the great, I'm very proud to say, massive street protests uh, in Toronto at the G20 meeting uh, in June 2010. There was a massive police riot with uh, enormous uh, uh, tear gas and repression of the protesters. Uh, uh, well, very few people know they know about that protest, but they don't know that at that G20 meeting, the G20 leaders said, we made a decision in 2008 to keep global capitalism going. We have maintained that. We are pr we've made the right decision and we pledge again to keep on doing that. Okay. So you see the extent to which uh, capital in globalization doesn't bypass states. It doesn't escape states. It doesn't make states less important. If anything, it makes them more important. They are central to globalization. Right? States are not the victims of globalization. Capitalist states, as I've often said, are the authors of globalization. Right? Of course, they do it as capitalist states and for reasons to do with the balance of forces inside their country. But they did something else in 2009. And that is they introduced the largest fiscal stimulus. You know, everybody thinks they kept austerity going in the face of this crisis. No. Even the Germans introduced the largest fiscal stimulus in post-war history. In the American case, it was the largest stimulus in peacetime history ever. Again, you think they're neoliberals, etc. No. Uh, facing uh, what they thought was Armageddon in capitalist terms, uh, they introduced the largest stimulus. And it was that that prevented the spiral to levels of 25, 30% unemployment, which is where Germany and the United States were by 1931, 1932. Those levels of unemployment have occurred, of course, on the southern periphery of Europe, right? Very famously in Greece uh, and, and in Spain. Right? where they've approached levels of 30%. And yet, I learned today that uh, Croatia's level of unemployment is something like 20%. Uh, but for the most part, that's certainly in, in the largest capitalist countries, that has not happened. Right? It's not to say the level of unemployment, which did approach 10%, it's not been severe enough. Okay? But not depression level levels. And that's why this has come to be known as the Great Recession rather than the Great Depression. And it was only after that <coughs> that you saw a return to austerity. Now, even that return to austerity, even that return to austerity in the United States was not driven by economists who read Hayek. Uh, to be sure, it was done against the will of the American Treasury under Obama. Uh, uh, but it was done by the Tea Party in Congress, the Republicans in Congress, but not because they're neoliberals or they read Hayek. It's the most basic anti-tax, I don't know if people know this famous novel by Sinclair Lewis uh, in the 1920s called Babbitt or Main Street. These are about small businessmen in middle America who hate to pay taxes and whose only thought is not to pay taxes. Uh, and that's mainly what the Tea Party represents. Right? It's old 1920s style American babbitry. Yes. Uh, and uh, Obama, of course, underlined this was no little degree of racism against an American black president. Uh, a distrust of him. He's also introducing a very compromised, and we would all think, uh, uh, hardly worth the trouble 
uh, uh, Medicare system, health system, which did take 10 million people who didn't have coverage and gave them coverage, but it's all done through the private insurance industry for the most part. Uh, that too caused some of the, but he, he was mainly, however, incompetent, partly because he was black, in terms of being able to control Congress. That's what's limited, that's what's brought austerity to the United States. Uh, not some ideology. The Treasury has wanted to keep the stimulus going and because they couldn't keep it going, the Federal Reserve, the central bank, has run the most unorthodox monetary policy in which they have simply continued to throw money, dollars, into the banks to buy their bad mortgages, to buy their other bad, especially mortgages off their books to take them onto the books of the central bank uh, and to uh, shove the banks full of money. That doesn't quite get you out of the crisis because the corporations are already sitting, since it wasn't a profitability crisis, on tons of cash. The 300 largest global multinational corporations are sitting on trillions of dollars of cash or very short-term investments. The problem is not the profitability crisis, it is that they aren't investing that in employment. Right. They don't see the possibility of realizing those profits. It's in Europe and the Americans have been very unhappy about this, that you've seen something more similar to a neoliberal, Hayekian-driven, orthodox policy, especially in the case of the German Bundesbank, which effectively controls the ECB, or at least puts a veto on what the ECB can do. And when, uh, in the wake uh, of the uh, uh, 2008 2009 downturn. By the end of 2009, the euro entered into crisis because individual states who in the euro no longer have central banks which have their own monetary policy, which can devalue their currency, which can print money, etc. Uh, and they had already borrowed to bail out their banks. Yes, to buy off their banks, to bail them out, uh, or to engage in the stimulus. And they wanted to go back and borrow more. They couldn't do so. They're all stuck inside the euro. They don't, they don't control their own currency. In order to be able to deal with this, the European Central Bank had to do what the American Federal Reserve was doing which was to pour liquidity into these systems. Yes. To lower interest rates to zero. To effectively print euros. Right. Or it had to continue a fiscal stimulus. And after all, since social democracy is so much stronger in Europe, right, since there isn't a tea party at that time in Europe, you might have think that they would do this. But the Germans in particular have always been, in this respect, very Hayekian. The Germans have been responsible, uh, in, and it's a very old policy going back to even the crisis of the 70s, for trying to ensure that, balance, ba ba that fiscal balances occur and that uh, the banks do not print money and cause inflation. The Americans have been extremely unhappy with this. Geithner, the American Secretary of the Treasury, either phoned or visited European central bankers 168 times. He has to keep a record, according to Congress, of his international meetings. And the, the record showed that in his period in office from 2009 to 2011, 168 such visits. The most fractious meeting amongst European leaders when it looked after Syriza almost came to office in June 2012, when it almost won the election then, with enormous pressure on Merkel 
to have the Bundesbank play this loose fiscal, this loose financial and monetary role. That meeting was chaired by President Obama. It took place at the G20 meeting, so he was there. Now, it's not that the Americans were trying to necessarily impose this on Europe. Those countries who wanted the European Central Bank to play this kind of role were begging the Americans to convince the Germans to do this. Right? So they were being pulled in. It's not an imperial relationship in the sense that America tells Europe what to do. That's not the type of relationship it is. It's a highly integrated capitalism right, in which European capital has a large presence as a social force in North America. And American capital has a large presence as a social force inside Europe and in many other parts of the world. But it's not an imperial relationship in the sense that these are colonies. Right? So they can't tell Europe what to do. And as this crisis has spiraled in Europe, uh, the Americans have tried to put heavy pressure on the Europeans to take some responsibility for containing crises in global capitalism. And it's in this sense that it's really only the uh, American state, primarily the American state, who takes that responsibility. Uh, the, the, for all of our thinking about Europe as a supranational capitalist government, what has been clear in this crisis is that the center of gravity remains at the level of nation states. And of course, the power of those nation states is very asymmetric. And inside Europe, the German nation state has been at the center in terms of understanding this spiral uh, that's occurred and is still occurring uh, in Europe and may bring us into a second crisis. Now, has this caused a crisis of the capitalist state? It may be doing so in the European Union. And there were some evidence that it may have done so in the United States, but I don't think it's working out that way. When, you may remember, there were those standoffs between Congress and Obama, the American Treasury, over whether they would pass legislation to raise the debt ceiling, to allow the American Treasury to borrow more money, to issue more Treasury bills, and the whole world wanted to hold treasury bills because when other assets are not stable, it's the belief that the American state is the one state that will never default on its debt. So we're always where capital goes. And this has been the case since the 1930s. The, any capital that could get out of Europe in the 1930s, even under Roosevelt when Wall Street was calling him a socialist, went to the United States. That's why Fort Knox was full of gold. Right, by the time of World War II. Uh, that's always been the case. The world bourgeoisie has seen the American state in this sense. So there was no problem about selling treasury bills at zero interest rates, because that's what it was. Given the rate of inflation, they were paying nothing for these. But this was the same, was safer than gold. Okay. The American Main Street, Babbitty, Tea Party Congress said, oh no, we can't be borrowing this much from the world, yeah. and tried to put a ceiling on. Uh, uh, and in that sense, it looked like there might be a crisis. And indeed, one of the bond rating agencies actually downgraded the American Treasury bill during one of these standoffs. In the end, uh, Congress relented, as Congress has always done in these standoffs. Indeed, under Clinton, when this happened, Robert Rubin, it was a Democratic Congress then that was doing it. Uh, Robert Rubin, his finance uh, minister, said, uh, uh, Congress wants to make it look like we're responsible, uh, but will in the end allow us to do whatever we want to do. But they want us to look responsible rather than them. And that's always been the case. And even if, in this case, they had not allowed them to do it, you can be sure they would have found other means of lifting that debt ceiling using smoke and mirrors. They wouldn't have defaulted on the debt. Democracy is not so strong in the United States that what Congress determines the deep state does, whether it's the Pentagon or the CIA or the Treasury or the Federal Reserve. Uh, uh, 
In Europe, uh, it does indeed appear that this may be producing a crisis of the state, not in the sense that Europe is about to fall apart, although the Americans certainly are very worried that should Syriza get elected, and should it be forced into a situation, uh, if they make them abandon the euro because they withdraw on all of the austerity and memoranda that have been imposed, Right. and introduce capital controls, that that could lead to a cascade of capital controls in Spain, in Portugal, etc. The Americans are very worried about this. At the moment, that's unlikely to happen. Most of the banks have written off all of the Greek debt. Uh, uh, Syriza, if it's elected, will do these things, but it won't cost that much. I don't think they'll be thrown out of the euro, and they don't want to leave the euro. But we see a crisis in a much deeper sense. We see a crisis in the sense of far-right xenophobic parties who are anti-European Union, not in the sense that most of us in this room would be, that is, we're critical of the European Union because it's a capitalist Europe rather than a socialist Europe, right? Because it's a Europe that primarily is about the free movement of capital. Uh, you now see the rise of very significant social forces. Some have been around for a long time, some new ones are emerging, which represent a xenophobic reaction not to the movement of capital, but to the movement of labor inside Europe. You see it with UKIP in Britain, you see it above all with the National Front in France, most seriously. And this could create regime crises. It's not to say that these parties are fascists. There are fascist elements operating in Europe, certainly. And some of the same symptoms that are leaving working people who last year voted communist to now vote for the National Front right, are similar to the symptoms that led people to vote for the fascists in Italy or, or in, in Germany during the Depression. No. Uh, uh, it's not that they are they're most clearly not fascists in the sense that most of them are in favor of the free movement of capital. Right? They are not, in that sense, economic nationalists uh, so much as uh, xenophobic ones, chauvinist ones, uh, etc. But nevertheless, this may create a severe regime crisis in Europe. In that sense, it could become a crisis of the capitalist state. All of that said, it's very clear that the character and scale of this crisis, I'll just say this quickly, is very different than the 1930s. Uh, the bourgeoisies of Europe, none of them, are national bourgeoisies in the sense of the national bourgeoisie that was prepared to support Hitler. They don't seek to accumulate within their own terrain or even on the terrain of Europe. They are, in that sense, oriented to transnational accumulation. And there's no evidence that any significant bourgeoisies in any of these countries are opting to support these parties. That's very different in terms of the character of the 1930s. The second uh, difference that's very important uh, uh, is that there hasn't been a breakdown in capitalist trade or globalization in this crisis, right? There hasn't been a breakdown of capital flows, as I said before. Uh, uh, the third difference is that despite all of the tensions between the United States and Europe in containing the crisis, uh, this has not been, and still is not, uh, in scale anything equivalent yet to the Great Depression. We'll have to see if now there's a spiral uh, 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 further. But of course, the greatest difference, the greatest difference is what's happened to labor. In the 1930s, a big factor in the rise of fascism was the strength of working class unions and of communist parties and of social democratic parties. This was a dialectic which was crucial 
to understanding the 1930s, and even in the United States, where it began to look in the 1910s like a socialist party might emerge. And then after the war, there was tremendous repression. I mean, socialist mayors were being elected in middle America on these main streets where these Babbitts reigned. Yes. And there was massive repression after World War I in the United States. There was no socialist party. Nevertheless, through the 1930s, you saw a rise of the labor movement, the building of industrial unions. Uh, and with that grew at an industrial level and in terms of linkages above all with black communities, the strength of the American Communist Party in civil society. It was a significant force. Almost all of the civil rights organizers in the 1960s became to be or trained as organizers by Communist Party organizers. They may have not been communists by the 1950s. You know, one wonders why they didn't break from the party, those who didn't break when Tito broke from the Soviet Union in 48. <laughs> right? Some of them stayed on, but many of them had left. But they had learned to be organizers in the Communist Party. And they were the ones uh, that, that most of the civil rights organizers cut their teeth with. Many of them were communists at some point themselves. So you saw a rise of labor movements, a strengthening of labor movements in the 1930s, or you saw a fascist destruction of them, but a destruction of very powerful ones. And what is astonishing about this crisis is the extent to which it's been a crisis of labor. Even as unemployment has declined, where it has declined, wages have not gone up. There's no wage pressure in the United States, even though unemployment now is below 6%. In fact, it has declined for 26 straight months, which is a record in the United States. Now, you know how soft this employment is. It's precarious workers. A lot of workers aren't on the labor market anymore. They don't appear as unemployed because they've given up looking for work, etc. Nevertheless, what's remarkable is that as those rates of unemployment have gone down, it has not led to wage pressure. And the reason it's not given rise to wage pressure is, of course, the defeat of the unions in the 1980s in the United States and their failure to recover. But it's not gone down for another reason, a more fundamental material reason, not just an organizational one, which is the effect of globalization on labor. That is, it was inevitable as the size of the global proletariat grew, and it's never grown so much as it has grown since 1980, in history, and I, both numerically and in percentage terms. Most of that, of course, taking place in China, but in India, in Brazil, etc. As what was left of the world's peasantry in the last quarter of the 20th century is being turned into a proletariat very rapidly. Right? That was bound to have an effect on the standards of living of the advanced capitalist working classes. How could it not? Right? People in Eastern Europe were unlucky enough to try to secure a standard of living defined by the Los Angeles Shopping Center just at the time when these global developments were taking place from financial deregulation in Sweden to much more importantly, the capitalist development in China, and it's linking into global capitalism, right, which was bringing down both the strength and the living standards of the advanced capitalist working classes that workers in Western Europe looked to right, as what they wanted to achieve. Now, to be fair, the way in which this works itself out doesn't always look like a decline in standard of living because you can now buy a pair of jeans produced by Chinese workers much more cheaply at a Walmart store if you're an American worker than you used to have to pay because the cost of the labor that's going into producing that gene is so much less, right? It's Vietnamese women working in a sweatshop for a dollar a day, 
right? And then Walmart sells those genes to American workers. And that cheapens the cost of their labor reproduction, right? So it doesn't necessarily always look like a decline in the standard of living. But inevitably, their ability to secure higher wages, uh, better benefits, stable jobs, not to be a precariat again, because let's remember, all proletariats were once precariats. When Marx was writing, the whole, except for craftsmen, the whole proletariat was a precariat. Auto workers used to be the most precarious of workers. It was only when they unionized that they secured some protection. So this was, is a material thing that was bound to happen. But it had an effect on union organization and the defeat of the left in the labor movements of the West, the revolutionary left in the labor movements of the West. Especially uh, in North America with the McCarthyite anti-communist witch hunt. Uh, had the effect of removing many of the most capable organizers. The people who might have been most capable out of the crisis of the 70s of finding a positive direction out of that crisis rather than a neoliberal one. So this is where the real crisis lies. And if, if you, in party terms, this is almost universal in labor movements and tragically, you're beginning to see this happening even with the Chinese proletariat. It's not only advanced capitalist working classes who can now can be whipsawed by this growth of the global proletariat in capital's hands. Now, uh, as Chinese workers have engaged in waves of strikes, of course all of them illegal strikes, informal strikes, because the Chinese unions, much more than the Yugoslav unions used to be, are agents of managers. Right? That's what the Chinese unions do. So these take place outside of the, with the communist unions, I mean. This takes place outside of their apparatus, and it takes place as local uprisings. It's had the effect of pushing up wages in China, and Chinese capital is now investing in other parts of Asia, right? in order to be able to secure and keep their contracts with Walmart. So the whipsawing is occurring everywhere. In political terms, astonishingly, this crisis has only produced one political breakthrough for the left so far. Maybe now we're beginning to see the possibility of a second, and that is Syriza. Really amazing if you think about it. Sure, I mean, in Venezuela and Bolivia, socialist governments have been elected. But this occurred before the crisis. And they haven't taken a new turn since the crisis, particularly. Uh, the only breakthrough has been that one, where Syriza has come to the doorstep of the state. Uh, and it's very significant uh, that this happened with a left organization that grew out of Euro communism that broke both with social democracy and with the very orthodox Greek Communist Party in the 1980s. And it took three decades of institution building and of embedding themselves in the social movements that emerged, uh, the anti-globalization movements, the student movement, et cetera, by 2001, two, three, four. And in a way that they weren't acting like political parasites on those movements. You know, they're only there in order to get them into the party. But really embedded in them in the sense of being fully part of those movements. That led Syriza to the point that it was able to make that breakthrough out of the Euro crisis. But that's been it. So I think soberly, we have to say on the left uh, that the crisis has shown up most as a crisis of labor. Both in the usual sense of a capitalist crisis is that who pays the cost for it, but much more profoundly in organizational terms, in institutional terms. It's shown up most at the moment as a crisis for labor. There are signs that may be more of that for capital, more of that for capitalist states, but even if it is, one of the reasons that these parties of the right may be breaking the European integrated capitalist regime 
is because there's no left able to fill the vacuum as the French Socialist Party collapses. Right? And workers have nowhere else to go in terms of somebody picking up their discontent. Uh, this has enormous consequences for even what Syriza might do, or even if Podemos, if by some magic, and it's a much more ir incoherent uh, uh, party uh, just emerging now, and one that is not particularly closely aligned with labor, in fact, may be hostile to trade unions. Uh, often they often, it's, it's Tony Negri kind of politics, which is often critical of, of the very notion of labor organization. Uh, in some senses, I'll finish with this, we're back to 1917. Of course, it's like tragedy and farce, you know, then it was Russia, one of the great imperial countries, although an old type of imperialism. Uh, and it's little Greece all by itself, 10 million people, etc. Uh, but it's in this sense, that the Bolsheviks expected, uh, after all, that they would be the weakest link. Uh, that this would trigger a revolution in Germany. Uh, they were banking on that. Syriza, if it does come into office, even if it has the capacity with its cadre to turn the Greek state so it isn't a clientelist, corrupt, paternalistic state, it all can only have so much room for maneuver unless the balance of forces in Northern Europe changes to give them some space. They don't have to make a revolution, but for heaven's sake, to give them some space. And I don't just mean Germany. The people who have been squeezing Greece hardest are the Scandinavian Social Democrats. Right, who believe in free trade and fiscal probity, fiscal responsibility. So unless there's a shift in the balance of forces there, there won't be the space for Syriza. It's not to say they won't have some space. So in that sense, we're back to the question of international solidarity. Right? Now, with none of the expectations that one might have expected with the Second International, when you actually had mass socialist parties connected to one another, passing resolutions every year that if there's a war, we won't support our own governments, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And you get the tremendous disappointment that then followed. We're missing that institutional apparatus. In any case, it was clear then that what mattered was not what was said at the International, but what the German party did, what the Swedish party did, what the British party did. In that sense, and this remained, was true then, it remains true today. The really significant conflicts, even in the run-up to World War I, but way more true today, are not between states. They're within states. A lot of people talk about the BRICS challenging the American empire. It's ridiculous. Right? The BRICS bank they've announced uh, will only lend people insofar as the people as, to countries insofar as they already have an agreement with the IMF. Uh, the Remnibi is in, cannot become an international currency for two reasons. Shanghai does not have deep financial markets. And if the Chinese Communist Party liberalized all of their capital controls, it would be giving up its control over the economy. Uh, the Chinese state is fragile enough because capitalism has been developed so unevenly inside China. Perhaps the most uneven capitalist development since early 20th century Russia. Uh, who knows what will happen in uh, 75 years, 100 years, maybe there'll be a challenge from China, but that's the kind of timeline we're looking at. The significant states are, the significant conflicts are inside states. Whether they take the form of class conflicts between labor and capital of any productive kind is the question. Or whether they take a right-wing populist form, which may cause crises for states, but can only lead to something worse for labor, is the question. So we're in this kind of situation. You are in Croatia. 
we are in Canada, it's true of the left almost everywhere. It's true of these people who are engaging in strike waves in China. People need reforms immediately. They need some strength immediately. But we're all engaged in what Marx in 1850, after his youthful enthusiasm about the 1848 revolution, all engaged in a 1520, I'm quoting Marx now, a 1520, 50 year process of developing institutions through which working people can develop their capacities to change the world. And that's the dilemma the left faces today. People will only hear socialists insofar as they're able to speak to them in terms of things that can change their lives in the short run, affect them in the short run, offer them real reforms. And yet given what's happened in the history of working class institutions, I don't just mean communist parties, I mean social democratic parties, I mean trade unions, we don't have the institutional apparatus to even offer those reforms, let alone build the types of working class capacities to do more than that. It's a depressing story. Right? So it becomes, you know, for me, approaching 70, uh, and most of you are young in this room, I'm very happy to see. Uh, there'll be many, many attempts at socialist party building in the 21st century. It's obvious. You see it everywhere. Everywhere. But it's a long process. And the question is going to be, how do you manage to walk that tightrope between being somewhat effective in terms of advancing immediate struggles without giving up the long, difficult process of finding what types of organizational forms can be invented that can finally turn the proletariat into a class that can prove that the proletariat and the precariat and the cybertariat are not a different, not different classes, but are one class, can, broad, can define the class broadly enough that it can be an agent of change. We're trapped in this moment between the impossibility of reform and the long-term possibility of revolution at this moment. Uh, it's an enormously difficult moment. I wish I had a more optimistic uh, uh, message to give you. Uh, and I'm afraid the burden falls on the younger people in the room's shoulders to try to get out of this dilemma. Thank you. I want to say one more thing because I feel like I'm depressing you. <laughs> you know, there's been a lot of talk about the end of democracy, usually by social democrats who really mean that they don't see much room for reform anymore. Uh, and I don't think this is true. Not even true given the rise of these right-wing parties in Europe. You know, the enormous difference in this country between now and the 80s from all, for whatever else has been lost and how, if you like, unfortunate it was that one didn't go beyond an undemocratic communism, although yours had more elements of democracy than others, uh, to a genuinely democratic socialism. You know, the fact is that there is more room for having these types of meetings more information available to people of a broad, general kind, even if the media of the, the traditional kind is sewed up by powerful media conglomerates, it is still the case that small types of uh, uh, journals, newspapers, and above all, the internet are available in terms of spreading information that there isn't the type of repression and closure of political space uh, that existed under uh, capitalist dictatorships or authoritarian communism. So you're in a dilemma, but there is more space than in the 1930s crisis for the most part. And that, you know, is, is a reason for optimism. What we have to watch for, you know, is that if 
these right-wing movements do turn out to be the types of right-wing movements that can close down bourgeois democracy, that can close the state space to freedom of speech, freedom of association, etc., then we'll be forced into popular front politics, joining with everybody to the left of those far-right parties in order to keep that space open for us to organize. Unfortunately, that type of alliance leaves us less space for creativity in terms of developing new democratic socialist institutions. So we do need to hope that this crisis of regimes in France and maybe elsewhere uh, does not unravel into the type of crisis of democracy where there really is an end to democracy. There's an end to reformism, but there's not an end to democracy at the moment. That's just uh, social democrats scaring themselves because they are afraid to offer any reforms or don't have the capacity to win any. There's still room, plenty of room, for people to have meetings like this. Thank heaven. Okay. I think that's a little better note to end on. <laughs> Uh, so please now we have time for questions and comments. We start. I should tell you uh, that when I finished talking in Kumarvitz 25 years ago, he told behind me, and I told him this thesis of the iron law of oligarchy, which you never read in a Leninist party, of course. Um, there was dead silence. The suits in the room didn't know where to put themselves. And the guy who introduced me was very embarrassed that nobody would ask me a question. And he kept encouraging me. Finally, he was yelling at them. Somebody must ask me. And one guy at the back picked up his hand and he said, your name is Panitch, so you must be a Yugoslav. What would you do if you were prime minister of our country? And only one word came to my head, but I didn't say it out loud. Resign. <laughs> so don't be like the suits in the room. We have two questions here. Just leave it then. Well, maybe to, maybe to just, maybe a little, uh, to spoil a little bit more optimistic version of your ending. Isn't it precisely, as you said um, earlier, the 30s fascism to a large extent was enabled and the reaction to the strength of the land? And yeah. isn't the relative scope of, of freedoms that we still enjoy in this uh, term, and uh, uh, also a very, a very, um, a, a very, um, you know, a, a kind of confirmation of our own marginality in terms of if you, you're not really perceived as a danger so well, you can have these meetings and so on. So it's also a symptom of a, of a, of a deep historical decline rather than being uh, maybe um, uh, a virtue I, in itself, okay? I agree. Yeah. But what I wanted maybe to ask, but maybe not. But if there are other questions, so well, well, I'll take a few anyway. So if you want to talk, to, uh, that's good. Uh, that's uh, too long. Okay. Uh, well, earlier, um, okay, I'll calm down. Um, earlier, you were saying about crisis theories, dominant crisis uh, theories uh, within Marxism, and there are more. There is more than one uh, narrative, and it's very. Uh, and you have uh, explicitly said you don't perceive this as a crisis of overaccumulation. Uh, but rather uh, as a crisis of investment. A crisis of finance. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, a crisis of finance, but you said also a crisis of investment, right, if I understood you correctly. Yeah. Um, well, uh, but it, the argument would then be, of course, for someone, to ob obviously, to say, well, a crisis of investment is basically also a crisis of the perception of, of future profitabilities. Yeah. And uh, thereby, you cannot so neatly um, uh, differentiate one from the other. So uh, eventually, uh, it still contains an element of, of, a, of crisis of profitability, in, at least in the sense that uh, there is uh, that the capital that is accumulated uh, does not see uh, future profits, uh, profitability uh, at, at satisfactory levels, and therefore the, the, uh, uh, does not invest because this would be irrational. And then the shifting towards finance, of course as many have argued, would be uh, um, well, a seeming way out. But of course, in the long term, um, uh, fictitious capital, or, or um, uh, as, it, as it's called, also depends, in the, in the, you know, in the last instance, on, on future profitability of the pr productive sector. So uh, rather than opposing, I mean, this, uh, rather than opposing it so neatly. Um, yeah. uh, so no, 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 not so. I'll come back. 
mentioning uh, Syriza on the, on the doorstep of capitalist state recalls uh, uh, very old po polemics of yours uh, and uh, uh, Ellen Wood uh, triggered uh, uh, by the book uh, by CV uh, person uh, where you propose uh, along, along with him uh, some sort of raiding uh, uh, the liberal uh, tradition of liberal de uh, democracy. Uh, so uh, uh, it's, uh, it may be hard, but it's not impossible to imagine uh, that Syriza would somehow uh, manage to raid uh, uh, liberal democracy and the capitalist state. So uh, what do you think uh, from uh, now about the prospects of transition? I'm glad to see somebody is still reading the old stuff. That's great. Uh, more questions? Okay, now you can uh, answer these two on. So, yeah, on the first one, uh, uh, yes, uh, I think in that sense you can say it's uh, a crisis of investment. The cause of it would be seen by capital as a underconsumption crisis. Uh, that they're given the financial crisis, the uh, fact that labor is not recovering its wage capacity, that its credit capacity is now limited since the crisis, uh, the likelihood of realizing profits is a limit on investment. But that's not the theory of the falling rate of profit. Yeah, of course. So yes, I agree with you. There's a link, obviously, between finance and production in that sense. I think we also need to be careful. Um, one of the reasons that there's not enough investment is that not that there isn't investment but that a lot of investment uh, in uh, given the technological revolutions we've gone through and my life has been totally transformed by the information technology revolution you know, I still wrote my PhD thesis longhand and then had a secretary type it uh, and I was doing that in, indeed until the mid 1980s um, uh, a lot of investment that yields significant productivity growth uh, does not involve heavy fixed capital expenditure. You discover a new software and it isn't a big expenditure of fixed capital. Uh, so it's not that it's because fixed capital is displacing labor so much. On the contrary, you know, uh, uh, it's that there can be heavy uh, new investment that, that has the effect of displacing labor, but not in the sense of there's m much more fixed variable capital locked up in it. Uh, Post-Keynesians are not right, are, are not wrong, and often uh, Marxists and Keynesians, and Keynes to some extent was picking up from Marx under consumption theory. They're not wrong in saying that what is needed in this crisis, given that big corporations are reluctant to invest, uh, that a way out of this crisis for capital, given labor's weakness, is in fact to have massive fiscal deficits. And indeed, insofar as corporations are reluctant to invest, that states should be borrowing in order to employ people directly. Almost in Keynes' sense of, even if you have to have them digging holes in the ground and then filling them up at the end of the day, right? Even if it isn't all that productive. Uh, but of course, given the ecological crisis, and we haven't even talked about that dual crisis in capitalism today, uh, there's enormous scope for very heavy capital expenditure of a kind that only states are likely to do. Uh, with, which would involve direct employment, uh, leading to energy saving, uh, uh, capital infrastructure, uh, not to speak of the enormous investment that could be undertaken in transportation infrastructure, in public housing, uh, etc. And again, you know, it's not just a matter of that people are reading Hayek or economists are whispering in their ears. States have lost the capacities to do those things. Certainly the capacity to do them quickly. State institutions, including in this country before 1990, 
had the capacity to undertake massive capital projects. In the United States, for instance, when they had the biggest stimulus in peacetime history, 2010, the Department of the Environment, where most of this should take place as massive investment and direct employment too, the Department of the Environment had put in for $30 billion in that budget and it got it. Its request for the $30 billion was largely made up by a Marxist economist who's been advising in a rather weak way the Obama administration, Robert Pollan at Amherst. He wrote it up in a weekend because inside the Department of the Environment they didn't have the capacity to come up with such massive expenditure proposals. And they got the $30 billion and they couldn't spend most of it. They didn't have the internal capacity right, to generate that type of capital and employment expenditure. So it, it isn't just a matter of the inclination of politicians. It's a matter of now of the capacity of state institutions to do these things. Uh, that is one of the breaks on capital getting of capital estates helping capital get out of this crisis. Right? So one of the things I think we need to be doing is not to be at all worried about being reformist. I'm sure you're not. In calling for uh, uh, massive state borrowing, saying the IMF is saying it that uh, it would pay itself off. If you borrowed the money at very low interest rates, which are available to most states today, right? not all, but most states, if you borrowed the money, of course, if uh, the ECB would make it easier to do so, it would help, uh, and you invested in big capital projects that involved a lot of labor employment, it would pay for itself in terms of kicking in a regeneration of demand for cap for investment, and then private capital would follow. That's unlikely to happen, uh, partly because of ideological factors, partly because of the strength of Germany and its obsession with keeping uh, the euro low so it can keep its uh, export strategy going and its class alliance going around that export strategy. Uh, but it's also the problem with that is the lack of state capacity to do this. That's why we need front and center, and I was very happy to see in Ljubljana last night that this little pamphlet was being distributed when I talked uh, to socialize the banking sector. Uh, now, they're lucky, actually, in Slovenia that most of it is still in state hands. It, they run like capitalist banks, so not all of them. The trade union bank is better. Uh, you've given up most of yours, but the crucial reason inside capitalism now, let alone for socialist economic planning again, the crucial reason for the banks to be taken into the public sector and turned into public utilities, like water companies are, are public utilities, right, is that this alone allows you to intervene in directing where investment goes. Of course, the banks would have to utterly change their function and their mentality. And we would have to have the type of people who are capable of going in there to do that. Uh, but socializing the banking system, even in Keynesian terms, let alone in socialist terms, because for ecological planning, as well as for socialist planning, you can't imagine it being done without that. It's inconceivable. Right? It's irrational to imagine it could be done without it. Uh, so I think these are the types of things with a lot of confidence. And even quoting the IMF to some extent, one can say these days uh, and get some traction. As for the other thing, uh, uh, he was referring to a debate I had in the pages of the Socialist Register with Ellen Wood in 1980-81 was an essay I wrote called The Antinomies of C.B. McPherson. McPherson was a Canadian Marxist political theorist who Ellen Wood didn't think was much of a Marxist because he didn't play with the falling rate of profit. Um, because he wasn't all that interested in the question of the separation between the state and the economy and the transition to 
from feudalism to capitalism and so on. Uh, but his, he used to mainly, to, for, to, his, to, to, to indicate what he did, he mainly spoke to liberal theorists and said, look, if you're true to your liberal principles, especially if you're a John Stuart Mill liberal, and you see the point of liberal democracy, as John Stuart Mill argued, as developing the citizenship capacities of those who are excluded from the political system, right? Uh, he saw that's what liberalism's point was, to develop the capacities of those who now didn't have the capacity to be citizens, women, workers without property, etc. The point of liberalism was to develop their capacities, right? And you needed freedom of association and freedom of speech, etc., to do that. Much the same point that Luxembourg said to Lenin when the Bolsheviks closed down opposition parties. Without freedom of speech, without freedom of association, how are workers going to develop the capacities to actually run the society? Right? She made the same point. And he would mainly say this to liberal theorists. He would say to Isaiah Berlin, you understand the negative point for liberalism, which is it puts a restraint on the authoritarian state. Right? It puts a restraint on the Leviathan. It puts a restraint on the Thomas Hobbes. Right? That's the negative side of liberalism. The positive side of liberalism, which John Stuart Mill was pushing, was developmental liberalism in the sense of developing people's interest in politics, the capacity to engage in politics, etc. So in that sense, I think maybe you can say McPherson was speaking to the wrong people insofar as petty bourgeois intellectuals are not going to make the revolution. But he had, I think, the right point that what so and you know he was saying if you want to be if you want to realize your ambitions as liberal political theorists, you need to become socialists. That's what his message to them was. Right? The message to like Luxembourg's message to Lenin, the message to socialists is that they can't be socialists without transcending, in the best sense, liberal, liberalism. That is transcending it by incorporating it being those who actually fully implement freedom of association, freedom of speech, and fully are oriented to developing people's capacities in the political arena, in the economic arena, in the cultural arena, etc. So uh, can Syriza do this? Uh, I don't want to depress people again. Um, Uh, I think they would like to. I think they would like to. Their problem is again an institutional one, not a ideological one. Uh, I was hinting at it before. Uh, say they have 10,000 really capable cadre and their membership has been growing enormously. I don't know how big it is now, maybe even pushing 100,000. Say they have 10,000 really capable cadre. Uh, to go in and change that Greek state so it's not a clientelist state. And moreover, it's not just a capitalist state which is mainly oriented to reproducing, even efficiently, capitalist accumulation and, and class structures, but actually is trying to be the kind of state that intervenes in society in such a way as to develop people's capacities. Right? All of its cadre would be absorbed into the state and they still wouldn't have enough. Then who would be left in the party to do the kinds of cadre organizing that still needs to be done, right, even while they're in the state? Not only to check their power in the state, but to organize all those people who are unorganized in, inside Greece, right? To be the base of Syriza outside the state that would renew it, that would light a fire under it that would criticize it, etc. And it's, again, they're very aware of this, but if you ask them, you know, are you from, say, the solidarity networks, that Syria acts, here's the activists, in every square, in every city are part of it, not even leading, you know, in terms of distributing food in the face of people losing their ability to even reproduce themselves that way, providing people with pharmaceuticals now that they can't get any subsidized drugs in, in the drugstores, etc. 
They're very active in this. These series of members of parliament are kicking back their salaries, good chunks of their salaries to the solidarity networks. But the people that they meet there, they don't bring them to series of branch meetings. And I ask, why don't you? And they say, oh, Someone comes to one of those meetings and we have these abstract debates about is there a plan B for getting out of the Euro? Or even worse, somebody puts a, revolu a resolution on uh, turning Syriza into a Leninist revolutionary party and they think they come into a, uh, you know, a, a, a hall of mirrors. You know, and they, they, the party branches aren't constructed in such a way as to be able to bring people in in a fruitful way into the party. Even more chilling, a doctor in a clinic, when I, I said this at a public meeting with Tsipras and, and the man who's going to be finance minister on the panel with me, and they largely avoided this. They didn't deny it, but they avoided it. A doctor uh, who in a public health clinic said that he had taken from his community uh, 150 unemployed people to the Syriza headquarters. Uh, with a proposal to do something in their community. And the people in the Syriza headquarters didn't know what to do with them. And they were left standing outside the building for hours while they were trying to figure out what to do with these 150 people who were coming to make a proposal to Syriza for their community. Now, I, you know, I don't, I'm not blaming Syriza. I mean, I think this is a reflection of how difficult this is. Uh, you know, we can have an abstract conception of going into the state and having the institutional capacity to make the full promise of liberalism and socialism viable. But boy, is it a large institutional task. Uh, and in Syriza's case, if you're asking about Syriza, it's not there yet. And it's gone furthest and maybe is most conscious of this, uh, of any of the groupings around. More questions? Comments? Resign. <laughs> uh, maybe a quick question. Uh, if you're not so optimistic uh, about Syriza, uh, what do you think about uh, the South America and the socialist projects there, which are much more uh, bad? Yeah. Well, I'm hopeful. Uh, I think the worst kind of international solidarity is what uh, Sidney and Beatrice Webb, the famous British Fabians, uh, engaged in in the 1930s when they went to the Soviet Union uh, just as the show trials were reaching their height. And they came back to Britain and they said, I've seen the future and it works. Uh, because they saw full employment amidst the, in the 1930s. So I think those people who go to Venezuela or Bolivia or looked at participatory budgeting during the World Social Forums in Porto Alegre, Brazil, and they went like Sidney and Beatrice Webb. And, you know, they meet with the propagandists of those regimes. And good regimes have propagandists too, <laughs> as we know. Uh, and they don't ask any critical questions. They don't ask, what problems are you coming up against? What contradictions are you facing? What blockages are you facing? What's not working? Uh, I don't think they're doing anybody any good. Uh, and there's far too much of that. And then people get dispirited when they see uh, those uh, regimes in Latin America running up against blockages. So there are obviously, if we take the Venezuelan case, uh, uh, you know, limits, uh, which are obvious. One of the limits is this. Yeah, is Chavez's face everywhere, right? Uh, which un is understandable, you know, it captures from uh, people whose participation in public life is limited to, at best, participation in religious institutions. It captures some of what a Christ figure does in a religious institution. Uh, uh, but uh, it is very problematic, obviously, not least when that guy dies, as happened with Lenin and Chavez and so on. Um, more than that, uh, the uh, 
Venezuelan revolution was not very capable, uh, I don't blame it for this, it just didn't happen, of exactly this comrade's point, of changing the institutions of the Venezuelan state. Most of the progressive things it did, it ran through the presidential palace. In parallel organizations, inside the palace to each state apparatus. So the health program, for instance, with the Cuban doctors, was not run through the Department of Health for the most part. It was run through the palace, through these missions. Similarly, the big welfare programs, the alternative education systems were run through the palace. And the reason for this was the difficulty they found in changing the Venezuelan state institutions, where the middle classes, the petty bourgeoisie were deeply implanted, the technocrats were implanted. This also occurred for a long time with foreign affairs ministry. Uh, so that's another problem. Uh, thirdly, they did create uh, a party, a mass socialist party, the PSUP, which was supposed to be a, the kind of party that would encourage people's participation, develop their capacities. Some of that was going on through the missions, but directed through the party, which would be a source of renewal and pressure, uh, but instead it was very top-down, very top-down, before Chavez and after Chavez. And now it becomes an arena for struggles amongst people with different institutional bases inside uh, the, Vel the Bolivarian leadership uh, as they struggle over Chavez's heritage. So good things have been done, uh, but I don't think we should be naive uh, about how far things will go. Uh, one could be more optimistic about Bolivia uh, remarkable thing, this is a party that came out of a social movement of indigenous people and poor people, uh, mainly in the agricultural zones and in the favelas. Remarkable thing, but there again, as I fear with Syriza, most of the capable activists have gone into the, Bo the, the Bolivian state. And there's very little left out in the movements outside, except those sometimes who are just oppositional for the sake of being oppositional. Uh, uh, but most of the good cadre have gone into the Bolivian state. That has helped it. Uh, it's seen it through some tremendous class struggles from the landowners and the bourgeoisie. Uh, but I think we should be quite aware that morale is even more than the rhetoric we got from Chavez is fairly clear about this not being a socialist revolution. And is also fairly clear about being dependent on Brazil. And they are. And the Brazilian Workers' Party has turned into a classical social democratic party, uh, which is moreover engaged in uh, a sub-imperial project of supporting its multinational corporations as they expand around the world. Not only in Latin America, but in Africa, and even in the United States, where the big Brazilian food processing companies have been taking over American companies. Uh, or in Canada, where the big Brazilian uh, mineral companies now own our biggest nickel mines in Canada and have involved in strikes against Canadian workers. Uh, you know, that's very tragic, and it shows you, you know, the, the Brazilian Workers' Party began as a party that said, as I used to say, as a naive, non-Leninist Marxist in the 1970s, what we need are post-Leninist, post-social democratic parties. And they pledged themselves that when they got into government, they would continue to be organizers. They would continue to do what they were outside the state, which is to organize the unorganized. That's what they said they would do. And then as soon as they got into the state, they started electing mayors uh, by the late 1980s. They found it very difficult to continue to do that. They got overwhelmed by the process of running Porto Alegre. And then even when they did some creative things, like they did create participatory budgets, especially in Porto Alegre, and black women with virtually no education were given the resources to make a decision, do you want to build a road in this favela or do you want to build a sewer in this favela? Yes. And that was important, and they had that right to make that decision. 
The trouble was they didn't trust them to take them to any higher level of strategic discuss discussions or involvement in the class struggle. So you know when you build a sewer or a road in a favela, which is a piece of land owned by a landowner, which he is not cultivating, and under Brazilian law, it's then legal to occupy that land and build shacks on it. Right? Or, if you're a peasant, to actually produce on it, as the Landless People's Movement does. Uh, but when you build a sewer on that land, and the runoff is then controlled, and it becomes, again, possible to have a housing development on it, not just shacks, right? or to, build, to have productive agriculture on it, the landlord can come along and say, this is now productive land, I want it back. These are the rights to private property. In most cases, they don't ask for that. They ask for compensation on the land, because now that it's productive. This is what happened in Porto Alegre. This is a class struggle. But that discussion of what to do about that never took place in the participatory budgets. Never, 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 never was it even discussed. Right? So they didn't have this conception of developing the capacities of people in the sense that McPherson meant it, right? Not at all. That was kept within the cadre of the Workers' Party. Right? In any case, by the time Lula got in, it was a classic parliamentarist social democratic. It's done some welfare reforms, as social democrats do. The Bolsa Familia is a good thing. It costs a very small part of the budget because people are so poor that you add a little bit of money, it doubles their income. Right? And that's now Lula's base. His used base used to be industrial Sao Paulo. His base is now the poorest of rural areas in the Amazonia. That's where uh, the Workers' Party got its votes last time. Right? Uh, this is like with the ANC, South African Communist Party alliance in South Africa. What happened to the Brazilian Workers' Party is in terms of people who are looking to find a post-Leninist, post-social democratic political direction uh, for socialism in the 21st century. These are our two great tragedies so far. Right? Um, but, you know, Beckett in, which play was it? You're the dramaturge. Uh, Beckett, you know, uh, said, uh, uh, try. Was it Waiting for Godot? Anyway, you try, fail, try again, fail better, try again, fail better still. That's what we're in. So we have time for a lot more questions, for comments. Maybe to come back uh, to the question of relation between the American capital and European capital, you were saying. How do you see the development of a trade, tra transatlantic uh, trade and investment partnership uh, mm. uh, uh, developing uh, in, in, the uh, in the context of uh, putting more pressure to the democratic uh, instruments and uh, yeah. taking, uh, taking away democratic space for, for broadening and uh, strengthening of that politics? Free trade agreements from the beginning have been free capital agreements. Tariffs are already so low for the most part, except marginally in agriculture. A little bit in business services, but not much. That the, these agreements are not about uh, free trade, really. They are about free capital. And in this case, the core of that agreement uh, is the agreement on investor rights, which was the center element in the NAFTA. Right? In the, there were, tariffs weren't important between Canada and the United States in the 1980s. It was a free capital agreement uh, with uh, uh, Chapter 10 of NAFTA is exactly this controversial clause which allows corporations to take governments into arbitration tribunals if they don't treat foreign capital the same as they treat domestic capital. And it gives Social Democrats an enormous out because they don't even have to wait for them to take them to the courts. So in Canada, we elected in Ontario 10 million people, as big a country as Greece or Sweden, just in that province of Ontario. We elected in 1990 for the first time since after World War I. We had a farmer labor government then. We elected the Social Democratic Party as government with a majority. It's 
called the New Democratic Party. And their one faintly socialist pledge was that they would take car insurance, motor vehicle insurance, yes, in order to be able to drive a car, you were required to buy insurance. So when you kill somebody, he can't sue you for a million dollars or you know whatever. Uh, so you were required to buy this, and you still are, from private insurance companies. That's how capitalism works. They make it a requirement of everybody to do something, and then but you have to buy it from a private corporation. They accumulate on that basis. Mm -hmm. So he promised public auto insurance, which, because it applies to everybody, can be applied, can be done more cheaply, just like health care. Right? Canada's health care is much cheaper than the United States as a portion of the budget. It's higher quality, but because you have a universal uh, clientele, you don't have all of the costs of competition and of monitoring expenses. It comes out of the budget. Everybody gets free health care. Everybody pays taxes for it. It's a non-commodified product. Right? So here they promised this. Anyway, he gave two reasons for backing off this. I mean, you can imagine, the insurance companies and the banks were screaming. Right? That was where the opposition was coming from. But he couldn't. I mean, he could have gone on television and said, I can't do this because these guys will go to New York and we'll try to send, sell American bonds, but they'll tell Wall Street that we are Bolshevik revolutionaries and the bonds will be 12% rather than 2%. Right? That's the real reason they couldn't do it, if they, they couldn't see it through. But he gave two reasons why he wouldn't do it. One was really shitty. One was that there are so many women working as secretaries in the insurance industry. And since he was a feminist, he didn't want to deprive women of jobs. Right? The second reason he gave was this one, was investor rights. That under NAFTA, every insurance company in the United States could seek compensation by saying that they had intended to compete in the Ontario insurance market, right? And by closing that off, they were denying them their right in NAFTA to compete in that market. That's the reason he gave. Ridiculous, and I don't even think that would have got through a tribunal. Now, this comes out of a piece of American legislation. I mean, this is the sense we're really under American imperial empire. I mean, of course, the bombing of Belgrade was American empire in the military sense. Uh, uh, the, the, what the American bases do around the world is American empire in the most basic sense. But in a much deeper sense, the American empire is this, that this comes out of decisions made by American judges at home, that if you a government introduces, this was done back in uh, the 1880s and then reaffirmed by progressive American judges like Wendell Holmes in the 1920s. If a government uh, uh, introduces a regulation for ecological reasons uh, to control the development of property, and this causes a delay in the building of a project by a capitalist, he can go into court and say that this amounts to expropriation because he hasn't been able to use his capital in time, right? Uh, and, and can seek compensation. This has always been highly contested in American jurisprudence. It's never been accepted. And they never knew when they went into the courts whether they would win this. But this was written into the international free, great, free trade agreements provisions. And for a considerable period, the American and British lawyers, it used to be retired French judges who sat on these tribunals, when corporations would challenge one another over breach of contract, or now more under this, this type of stuff, where corporations would challenge sovereign states. Uh, and it used to be old French jurists who weren't very progressive, and now it's the lawyers from international commercial law firms based in London and New York who sit on those tribunals. Okay? And for a while they were winning. So DuPont won from Czechoslovakia a larger penalty than the whole of the Czech health budget one year. That's a, lar that's a larger penalty than one from the Czech state to show you how effective this stuff can be. But 
increasingly these tribunals have taken the more and more the kind of contradictory position, you know, defeating a lot of corporations that try to use this in the tribunals as much as winning them. So it's not clear that they'll always win. But in any case, to get this provision in now would certainly constrain uh, European states. And uh, it looks like the Germans, in this respect, are standing up to that agreement. And if they can't get it out of the Germans, I'm not sure that it'll go through, given the centrality of Germany in, in any such uh, uh, agreement in Europe. So uh, I think that's the essence of what this is all about. I'm very happy to say that I think 350 uh, legal scholars and political economists have signed just recently a big petition against that provision in the agreement. I was one of them. Uh, uh, I think, you know, they may have to keep it out. And then it isn't quite as big a deal as you think. Uh, it's one of the reasons why the British Conservatives, certainly UKIP in Britain, is not so worried about leaving the EU. Because if you've got this agreement where uh, the United States and Canada, because we also are negotiating a parallel agreement, has you know, more or less the same rights as Croatia will have inside the European Union in terms of free trade and capital mobility, then it really doesn't matter all that much if Britain is in the EU or not, right? Uh, so it matters a lot, this type of agreement, I think, in terms of what will happen in Europe. Uh, but I think that the central element of, of it, which is really why they want it, is this investor protection agreement isn't likely to go through. I may be wrong, but I think it may be defeated. Yeah, this is an optimistic end. Yeah. Thank you, uh, thank you all for participating.